Welcome everyone to our annual Gladwin lecture, albeit virtual and via Zoom. Uh, for those that may not know, the Gladwin lecture series really started uh, since 1996 in memory of uh, Lord Gladwin, who was formerly uh, Sir Gladwin Jeb, father of the current Lord Gladwin, who sadly passed away recently, aged 96. Gladwin Jeb was also uh, the Council uh, for Education and the Commonwealth's first patron. He was very active promoting it in the House of Lords and Commonwealth Education Corporation. He addressed and chaired many CEC meetings and was a regular host of our parliamentary receptions in the 70s and 80s. Sir Gladwin became a peer in 1960 in recognition of his distinguished career as a British diplomat, a great architect rebuilding the international and European order after the Second World War. For four months in 46, 47, he was acting general secretary of the United Nations before the first substantive secretary general was appointed later. Later, he was Britain's well-known ambassador to the UN and to France and served for a time in the European Parliament. He was certainly a man to be reckoned with, and we are really honored to be able to carry on this annual lecture uh, every year. Now, before I introduce our key speaker and the theme for tonight's topic, a couple of housekeeping room, uh, rules, if I may. We currently have 48, 49 people registered or locked on. More will be joining in uh, later, I'm sure. Please do mute all your audio. I mean, it is, I can control the mute, but please do not unmute it, please mute it. Uh, we'll start off with Stephen, who will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for question and answers. For those that have not submitted any questions in advance, please use the chat box uh, to send in your questions. Our questions moderator, uh, Neil Kemp, who's one of his uh, trustee, will be mo monitoring uh, the, the questions coming through the chat box. If time permits, and if anyone who have not asked any questions through the chat box would like to make a comment or a class of questions or contribute to the discussions, please put up your hands or show me a sign, a thumbs up, and I will call upon you and I'll unmute you so that you can uh, uh, make a comment or ask a question, but please be respectful of the length you take to ask a comment, uh, to ask a question or make a comment. All right. It really gives me great pleasure now to actually introduce you, our keynote speaker, Stephen Tweet. I mean, Stephen has been actively involved in the education and international development agenda as he was chair of the UK Parliament's uh, International Development Select Committee. And he, if people remember, he was also an education minister in under the Blair Brown government. Stephen recently became the eighth Secretary General of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association on the 1st of August this year, and has recently launched a major consultation to prepare the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for its next strategic plan. Stephen will talk about the Agenda 2030, achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, goals how might the Commonwealth deliver success? As you know, one third of the world's population lives in 54 members of a country, and we've got another 10 years before 2030 to achieve those goals. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stephen Tweet. Stephen. Funny, uh, thank you very much indeed, and good evening, and also good morning, good afternoon. Um, it's great to see uh, so many people here, uh, a number of familiar faces and some new faces and I look forward to our conversation here uh, today. Today of course is uh, Remembrance Day, Armistice Day, and I'm proud to be wearing my poppy. It is a ceramic poppy that was made by school students at St Vincent's School for the Visually Impaired in my former constituency of West Derby in the great city of Liverpool. St Vincent's is a shining example of the very best in education. It is excellent, it's ra rated outstanding by Ofsted, it provides the high quality of education which all children and young people deserve, it is rooted in its local community 
and it has a rich and broad curriculum, including a powerful commitment to global citizenship and sustainable development with its strong international ties to countries including Gambia and Pakistan. It's an honor to be given the opportunity to deliver the annual Gladwin Lecture. This year, we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations in an era in which strong multilateral institutions are perhaps needed more than ever before. Lord Gladwin, as Sonny has already set out, was a champion of multilateralism. He was also an advocate for education. Can I say to you, Sonny, it's a particular pleasure for me to join you. I pay tribute to your strong personal commitment to the Commonwealth and to the cause of education reflected in your position as chair of the Council for Education in the Commonwealth. Five years ago in New York, the United Nations adopted Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs for short. The goals provide a comprehensive and challenging framework for the nations and citizens of the world to tackle poverty, climate change and injustice. And I think the Commonwealth has a vital role to play if we're going to deliver the goals. And by the Commonwealth, I mean all parts coming together, the institutions of the Commonwealth itself, the governments, the parliament, civil society, business, trades unions, local government, academia, and most importantly, the people, the people of the Commonwealth. As Sunny said, 2.4 billion people a third of the world's population, and of course, most of them under the age of 30. There are of course 17 goals with 169 targets and 231 indicators. It is a huge, complex and daunting agenda. And I know that there is a risk that the sheer scale, detail and ambition of Agenda 2030 might put people off. I hope not. I hope not. I am confident that with a shared commitment and a collective effort, we can make a reality of the challenge set for us by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres that the next 10 years should be the decade of action to deliver the global goals. Tonight, I'm going to focus on just two of the goals. Goal four on education and goal 16 on peace and justice. Before doing so, I want to pay tribute to the work already undertaken across the Commonwealth over the past five years to make real progress. Let me mention some examples. When I chaired the International Development Select Committee, we made the case for strong and effective parliamentary oversight of the goals, and we looked for international best practice. And we found that the Parliament of Uganda stands out as an exemplar of best practice in its engagement with the global goals. Last year, the Commonwealth itself made awards for excellence in the implementation of the SDGs. Malta was recognized for its whole of government approach to implementation. Namibia was recognized for its focus on alignment of the goals at the local level. And the Bahamas received recognition for creating institutional relationships, focusing on several key areas, including education. Now, COVID-19 has made the job of delivering the global goals even tougher. And our thoughts today must be with those who've lost loved ones to the virus, all of those that have lost their lives during the pandemic, to the many people across the world today who are still living with the virus. And of course, to the key workers whose dedication has made such a difference this year. COVID has reminded us of the critical importance of effective systems of public health and the stark reality of inequality, both within and between countries. The economic and fiscal effects have been and will be extensive with potentially very damaging implications for the world's ability to deliver Agenda 2030 as economies are squeezed, unemployment goes up and governments face tough fiscal choices. Education has been hit especially hard by the pandemic with school closures affecting children in all continents of the world. Today, I want to consider how the Commonwealth can play an active role in efforts to protect and extend education. 
in considering the scale of what needs to be done to deliver Global Goal 4, I will draw upon my previous experience whilst absolutely acknowledging the very different context that we're in today. For three years between 2002 and five, as Sonny said, I served as Minister for Schools. And in that role, I was responsible for the London Challenge, a government-led initiative to improve education across Greater London. It was a widely respected program, which I believe contributed to a sustained improvement in standards across the UK's capital cities schools. And I've given a lot of thought over the years to the broader lessons that we can draw from that time that I had as Minister for the London Challenge, and in particular for today, what relevance this has for the Commonwealth. And let me highlight five themes. The first is that funding is essential. We were fortunate that the London Challenge was introduced in an era in which public spending on education was rising, so we had the funds available to really make a difference. Investment in education is crucially important. But secondly, good levels of funding, whilst necessary, are not sufficient. What we found that different schools or local authorities with similar levels of funding often had very different results. So it's also about how the money gets spent, and in particular, the importance of teachers and teaching, the quality of teaching and learning, and the quality of leadership in schools and across the education system were vital factors in the success of London Challenge. Thirdly, collaboration is crucial. London Challenge was a central government initiative, but its impact was rooted in the active support and engagement of local government, of schools, of local communities. We didn't want to fall into the classic central government trap of naming and shaming failure. So for example, the schools that needed to improve were labelled, but they were labelled as the keys to success. And many of them, many of them underwent dramatic improvement. Fourthly, innovation. Innovation. We were ready to try new things in order to achieve progress. For example, the highly regarded Teach First programme started in London with many of its early participants placed in the keys to success schools. And fifthly, but crucially, leave no one behind. At the heart of London Challenge was a recognition of the impact of poverty and inequality on educational chances. So we tapped into London's extraordinary diversity. And one of my favorite memories of those three years was getting to attend the conferences that Diane Abbott organized, London and the Black Child, that were about engaging the passion and aspiration of black communities in London for a better education for their children and young people. I think each of those themes are as relevant today as they were back then. And they're as resonant for education in Africa or the Pacific or Asia today as they were to London in 2002. Investment, a focus on quality, collaboration, innovation, leave no one behind. Let me talk now about funding. There has long been a serious concern that global education financing faces a crisis. This has been com compounded by the impact of COVID and there is a serious risk now that investment in education globally will be squeezed as governments face falling tax revenues and urgent requirements to spend more in a range of areas, including health, support for the economy and business and social protection. The Global Education Monitoring Report has estimated that there was already a 148 billion, 148 billion US dollar annual financing gap in low and lower middle income countries if we were to achieve SDG4 in time. They go on to suggest this year that additional costs arising from COVID risk increasing this financing gap by up to one third. So that could mean an annual financing gap of around 180 or even 190 billion US dollars. We know that in high income countries, 
GDP is expected to decline this year by around 5.8%, according to the IMF's World Economic Outlook. The global outlook is a decline of 4.4%. This is going to make it much, much harder to tackle poverty in general. And for education, it has disturbing implications, both for domestic resource mobilization and for development assistance. Even if education were protected as a proportion of total aid, squeezed budgets could translate into a significant reduction in the amounts of money available for education of up to 2 billion US dollars. And it could take years before we get back to the previous levels of investment. It is clearly crucial, therefore, that wherever possible, countries are raising more domestically to support education. And we know that around a third of governments in high income and low income countries around the world do not meet the internationally recommended benchmarks that were adopted in 2015 in the Incheon Declaration that 15 to 20 percent of total public spending should be on education or around four to six percent of gross domestic product. However, there is an opportunity. In 2021, there will be the financing summit for the Global Partnership for Education, co-hosted by two Commonwealth leaders, President Ken Kenyatta of Kenya and Prime Minister Johnson of the United Kingdom. The Global Partnership for Education has set out ambitious goals to raise five billion US dollars to invest in education systems in countries that are home to around a billion children and young people. That additional investment will be essential, but how it is spent is equally important. Collaboration and innovation will be vital if we're going to deliver SDG4. Local government has a very important role to play working with central governments across the world to ensure that the vision of high quality education for all is achieved. And now more than ever, we need that spirit of cooperation to learn from each other about what works best. I've been impressed by the work of the Commonwealth of Learning, which has sought to foster innovation, including during the challenging circumstances of 2020, with its focus on distance learning, both in schools and in further and higher education. We know that there's huge potential for technology to help deliver high quality education, but we also know that there is a stark digital divide, and that is something we cannot ignore investing in the infrastructure of ICT and training in ICT was always important, but I think it is a priority whose urgency has been reinforced by the events of this year. Most importantly, we know that the quality of learning depends on having a motivated, qualified teaching profession. SDG4 rightly reminds us that this is a key target everywhere, but is especially urgent in the least developed countries and in small island developing states, many of whom, of course, are members of the Commonwealth. We should celebrate the education workforce and support them to be able to go back to work and to do so in safe conditions. Proper teacher education and continuing professional development are of critical importance if we are to succeed. Now, I spoke before about leave no one behind, and it is, of course, the mantra of all the sustainable development goals. We know that unequal access to education mirrors wider social and economic inequalities, and that many of these divisions have been exacerbated this year during the pan pandemic. For example, one feature in many countries has been an increase in the number of teenage pregnancies whilst schools have been closed. We know from previous crises the effect that this can have on the education and life chances of girls and young women. For example, during the Ebola crisis in 2014 to 16 in Sierra Leone, it's been estimated that 14,000 14, teenage girls became pregnant. And until recently, Sierra Leone effectively banned those girls from going to school. It's greatly to the Sierra Leonean government's credit that earlier this year they changed that policy 
so that pregnant teenagers are now able to attend school. I think there is a huge risk that girls' education and the progress that we've seen on girls' education could go into reverse. We know also that disabled children face some of the greatest barriers in life, including in education. The Commonwealth, I think, has a responsibility to champion the rights of children and young people with disabilities, including their fundamental right to high quality education. And I think the United Kingdom's G7 presidency has the potential here to make a difference with the UK pledging to put education in general and girls' education in particular at the heart of its presidency. When I think back to my uh, period as chair of the International Development Committee, some of my most poignant memories were the opportunity to meet with child refugees uh, across the world, including Rohingya children in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh and Congolese and other refugee children in Uganda. It's a testament, I think, to the governments and peoples of Commonwealth countries like Uganda and Bangladesh that they've shown such great hospitality to refugees. The international community owes it to these countries to help ensure that refugees and internally displaced children get the education they deserve. And I pay tribute to the efforts of Education Cannot Wait and others for bringing this to the world's attention. I am conscious, Sonny, that I've talked mostly about schools and access to primary and secondary education, but alongside this focus, we mustn't forget the importance of early childhood education, of technical, vocational education, and of course, of a thriving university sector. A strong system of lifelong education is a critical element both of an inclusive society and of a successful economy. And sustainable development relies on economies that can deliver jobs and enable new businesses to be created, good quality technical and vocational education and a strong university sector go hand in hand. We need to see both of these things if we are to enable young people across the Commonwealth to fulfill their potential. So how can the Commonwealth itself contribute to Global Goal 4? And let me start by saying something about parliaments and parliamentarians. Before I joined the CPA in August, I was involved in setting up IPNED, which is the International Parliamentary Network for Education. This new network has set out to strengthen the global voice of parliamentarians in making the case for education. IPNED actually covers the whole world, but I'm confident that legislators across the Commonwealth will join up with enthusiasm. Indeed, they are already. And the co-chairs are both from Commonwealth parliaments, Harriet Baldwin from the United Kingdom and Senator Dr. Muzaruve from Kenya. They are powerful voices for education. And last month, I was pleased to join members of the Kenyan Senate Liaison Committee to discuss the impact of COVID on their work. And I was delighted to hear that IPNED has taken off in Kenya and there is real pride that Senator Muzaruve is playing such a prominent role. In 2018, at the Conference of Commonwealth Education Ministers in Fiji, important commitments were made. The Commonwealth Secretariat, the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the Commonwealth of Learning came together to pledge to work to support member states to achieve the SDGs through education. And I look forward in my new role to working with a diverse range of Commonwealth organizations to push for education to be a high priority going forward in line with the pledge that was made in Fiji two years ago. The Commonwealth Education Minister's Action Group meeting later this month provides an immediate opportunity. And I know there is a rich and diverse range of Commonwealth organizations in the field of education. Working together, I'm confident that we can make education a true Commonwealth priority. Now, one of the features of the SDGs is that they are interconnected. Schools are, of course, vital for children's learning, but they're also important for children's health and therefore the health of the wider community. 
I've long believed in the power of citizenship education so that children and young people learn about their rights and their responsibilities. In many ways, the imperative for this is greater than ever. Good citizenship education can enable young people to be active citizens, both now in their youth and childhood and when they are older as adults. And it's why the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association values its engagement with young people and why I look forward to our Commonwealth Youth Parliament next month, which will be held virtually for the first time. And this brings me to Global Goal 16 on good governance and the rule of law. A safe, well-governed society is in a good position to deliver high quality education for all. Equally, a well-educated society is in a good position to deliver peace, justice, and good governance. One of the most horrific challenges in education is when violence is committed against schools, universities, and colleges. And in recent weeks, tragically, we've seen such violent attacks in Cameroon, in Afghanistan, and in Pakistan. These frightening acts, frightening acts, remind us how closely connected Global Goal 4 on education and Global Goal 16 on peace and security really are. A lot has been said in recent years about rising authoritarianism, violations of basic human rights, threats to civil society in many parts of the world. Global Goal 16, I think, provides an important template for challenging these trends. And for us in the Commonwealth, Goal 16 goes naturally hand in hand with our shared commitments and values embodied in the Commonwealth Charter and the Latimer House principles. Enabling parliaments and parliamentarians to be effective in their work is the core purpose of the organization that I now work for, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. And like everyone else this year, we've been adapting our work to the new circumstances of widespread travel restrictions, social distancing and lockdowns. We're developing the CPA Academy so that we can provide more learning opportunities for parliamentarians and parliamentary staff. Good quality training and development for parliaments is a very practical way in which we contribute to Global Goal 16. Let me reflect briefly on the current crisis and what it's meant for parliaments. I think when you have a situation like this, parliamentarians, legislators, have a difficult balance to strike. You know, rightly, governments seek to respond quickly to a public health emergency. And we've seen parliamentarians across the world uh, pass necessary legislation and budget measures. But there is still a very important responsibility on parliamentarians to oversee, scrutinize, sometimes challenge governments, especially in a protracted crisis like this one. There is a risk, we know this from previous emergencies in all parts of the world, there is a risk that emergency powers are open to abuse and that some might use a real crisis to seek to further weaken checks and balances or undermine civil society or threaten the rights of minorities. And I'm concerned that the sheer scale of the economic and social crisis that we're all facing as a consequence of this pandemic could distract us from some of the important commitments that were made in Global Goal 16. Some, for example, might argue that commitments to access to justice or tackling corruption are somehow less urgent as we focus efforts on rebuilding our economies, rebuilding our health systems, providing protection against rising poverty. But I would argue the opposite of that, that actually good governance should be able to help countries in the task of rebuilding their economies and addressing social injustice. And I hope that the Commonwealth in the months and years ahead will work with others, hopefully including the new administration in the United States, to place a renewed emphasis on the importance of peace and justice, good governance, 
and the rule of law. These are not optional extras. They are integral to sustainable development. That is why that goal is there. Corruption takes away resources that are desperately needed to provide good public services. Discriminatory laws serve to further entrench inequality and poverty and the denial of basic access to justice hits the most vulnerable sections of society the hardest. So goals four and 16 go hand in hand. Education for all and peaceful, just societies. But they don't just go hand in hand with each other. They are essential for the whole of Agenda 2030. Tackling climate change, building effective health systems, challenging gender inequality. All of these crucial commitments set out in Agenda 2030 are more likely to be achieved in societies that value education, that value peace and justice, that value the rule of law. I hope that we can all therefore work together across the Commonwealth to help deliver the ambitious goals set for us by the United Nations in 2015. And I would say in conclusion, Sonny, that in doing so, we would honour the values and commitments that led Lord Gladwin into a life of public service. Thank you. Stephen, thank you so much for the wide covering, insightful and very powerful lecture itself. You've, you've touched on so many aspects of it, uh, goal four and 16 and interlink between the two. Look, I don't want to eat too much into the question time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there must be loads and loads of questions. So I'm going to hand this over to Neil. Neil, is going to, you, Neil you're going to moderate the Q&A session? Yeah, thank you, Sunny. Um, I've had quite a few questions come in, and uh, I've tried to theme them a little bit. Um, not surprisingly, Stephen's already picked up on quite a number of them so maybe we need to explore them in a little more detail so um taking the the big picture first around the commonwealth uh i had questions from usha mystery richard mordit and patrick spaven we has put some questions to you one starting off around COVID and how much has it set back SDGs within which we should be achieving in 15 years. Um, you touched on that and explained in some detail, but given the challenges around this, should we be revising, uh, particularly the timeline, um, around the relationships of the SDGs, um, which of the SDGs can the Commonwealth add most value to the efforts of states, the UN, World Bank, and other intergovernmental organizations? So how would uh, the Commonwealth add to those? And also, specifically the CPA, how do you see the CPA's relationship with the international bodies like UNESCO, ACU, World Bank, and the others, which are have similar agendas to tackle these issues. So I trust that isn't too many, Stephen. No, that's great. Thank, thanks, Neil. Uh, let, let me deal with the three um, questions uh, in turn. So on, on COVID and its impact on the SDGs, should we be revising the timeline? My instinct is to say no bluntly in answer to that question. I think it is important that we keep the focus of 10 years time. I would worry if we um, you know, kept the same goals, targets and indicators, but gave the world another five years, that it would just result in uh, some of these issues falling down the agenda. We always knew, uh, even without COVID, that 2030 it was a challenging timeline. Um, for a lot of these, but I think we need to keep that focus, have the decade of action as the United Nations have said, 
and, and do our utmost to get as close as we possibly can to achieving all of the goals. The second question is always this, I'm having, I remember when we um, had the first inquiry when I was chair of the International Development Committee on the SDGs when they'd just been adopted. And we discussed this question of, should we argue that the UK should focus on particular goals? Um, and it's a similar sort of question, you know, where can the Commonwealth add most value? And, you know, a slightly sort of, I suppose, part of me wants to answer saying you shouldn't cherry pick. Um, and then you'll say, well, you've just given a lecture in which you've cherry picked two of them, but, uh, uh, but that was more a reflection of kind of um, you know, having 30 minutes. Uh, I do think in seriousness that uh, global, global Goal 16 is one in which the Commonwealth really can add value. You know, this was a goal that had to be fought for, uh, for it to be included. Uh, I think the commitments that the Commonwealth has via things like the Latimer House uh, principles uh, like the Commonwealth Charter to uh, good governance and the rule of law are important principles. So I do think actually, if you had to pick one where the Commonwealth institutionally can make a difference, I would go with Global Goal 16. You know, personally, as I hope was evident in my lecture, I'm very passionate about Global Goal 4, and I do want the Commonwealth to do more on, uh, on education. And I suppose the other one that I will mention is, is five on gender. Uh, and you know, I think that there will be a lot of voices uh, on uh, women's uh, empowerment and women's uh, equality and gender discrimination, but I think that is an area where the Commonwealth can add value. And then on the CPA, one of the things I'm, I'm really keen on, and it's implicit in the question, is for the Commonwealth Parliamentary Associ Association to widen and strengthen our partnerships, both with others within the Commonwealth, other Commonwealth organizations but also with uh, United Nations bodies and so forth. Uh, I'm very pleased that the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians uh, have agreed a memorandum of understanding with UN Women and I'm looking at ways in which we can have similar uh, strengthening of partnerships uh, within the UN and Sunny mentioned that I uh, have recently launched a consultation on our uh, strategy uh, to help us as we write our next strategic plan. I am very keen to hear as many submissions to that and voices in that debate as possible. It is an open consultation till the 27th of November, so please anyone on the call do feel free to respond either individually or from your organisations because I think the ability of parliamentarians across the Commonwealth to have an impact is going to be greater if we are working with, or sorry, they are working with um, others, including organisations that are on this call, civil society, uh, local government and others. Thank you. Um, can I uh, carry on within the education theme before broadening out into other um, more, more thoughts on SDGs? And this is concerning access to education for refugees. Again, you touched on it. Um, and James Erwick put a, put a queer question around uh, asking several Commonwealth countries, and you actually mentioned some of them like Bangladesh, uh, uh, I can't remember whether you mentioned Pakistan, but they've all have very many child refugees of school age in refugee settlements and many are being denied the right to education uh, in spite of the efforts of some governments. Um, there is an adequate provision and what strategy might Commonwealth organisations adopt to respond? I mean, I, I've been looking at in particular Rohingya in uh, Bangladesh and the one thing I found impossible is that they can't get access to any form of post-secondary education. I mean, some have got through secondary education in different ways, but they are not allowed in any way to access post-secondary. I mean, that's just an example. I don't know how it ru runs out in other countries. Over to you, Stephen. Brilliant. No, this, this, I think this is just such such an important uh, area and, and multi-faceted. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I referred to, I think I referred to um, Uganda and Bangladesh um, when I spoke as two countries that have taken very significant numbers of, of refugees, including um, child refugees. And I think it is very important to recognize that, you know, these, these are countries a lot poorer than 
the United Kingdom and they've taken significantly more um, refugees. Uh, but I remember going with the International Development Committee to Cox's Bazaar uh, and you know, the big challenges there in terms of the basic education. I mean, you've raised rightly the issue of post-secondary, but in terms of uh, basic primary and secondary, big, big challenges. I think it's got a lot better uh, than it was when uh, we went as a committee. But I, I, I do think that the whole international system needs to be better geared to providing support in these, in these situations. Uh, I think there's some interesting things that have been done in the Middle East to support Syrian refugees, and it's worth learning from some of the examples there. For example, some of the work that the World Bank has done, particularly in Jordan, to support refugees, including uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, some interesting projects, I think, in Lebanon around enabling uh, Syrian refugees to get access to uh, higher education. Uh, I've not looked in the specific context of the Commonwealth at this in, in great detail, and it's one of the aspects that I'd be keen to take forward working with, with other Commonwealth organisations to see what more the Commonwealth could do. But we what we shouldn't do, of course, is duplicate the efforts of others. And I mentioned uh, Education Cannot Wait, which has a very specific focus in this area. And I think a very practical thing that we can all do um, is to encourage those governments within the Commonwealth that, that provide aid to be giving proper finance to Education Cannot Wait, as well as to the Global Partnership for Education. The final point to make, of course, is that amongst refugees and displaced uh, children and young people, you then have um, the particular needs of um, uh, girls, uh, of uh, refugees with disabilities, uh, and recognising th those needs. There are issues, for example, if you've got um, child refugees living in camps about protection, uh, as well as about uh, education. And of course, as is the case everywhere, real questions about the barriers that exist for children with disabilities who are refugees to get even the most basic uh, education. And without going into even further detail, that also raises questions around resettlement opportunities in richer countries. So it's not just about what is done in the Bangladeshis and the Ugandas, but it's also about the responsibilities that uh, higher income countries have to uh, take a number of child refugees uh, on the basis of resettlement. Okay, th thank you. Um, there's quite a number come in that is sort of narrowing down perhaps a little at the um, individual country level, two or three interesting ones. One fr from taking them together, Stephen Blunden is currently in the Ministry of Education in Rwanda, oh. USAID project, but he's, he comments that Chogum is going to be in Rwanda in 2021. So what is the re relevance of the Commonwealth re with regard to Rwanda's delivery of the SDGs? And uh, another one that is uh, related um, is, the, is the general one on which you touched on a bit about equitable access and how do you um, ensure that individual governments meet their international obligations for equitable access, particularly for, well, for all children, for girls and those with disabilities. And then another uh, on a similar area is concerns um, uh, from Anya, Anya Nielsen, and Anya asks, uh, how do stakeholders, parliamentaries, parliamentarians, activists, leaders, children across the Commonwealth drive home the urgency of the learning crisis? How do we turn words to alarm to action? Thanks, Anya. That's a great question. Um, let me let me. Um, Sorry, have you got the most apologies? I got them all. No, I got them all, and they're they're all they're all great questions. So let let me let me deal with them um, uh, in order. So Steve, Stephen's point are from from uh, Rwanda. So yes, it's remiss of me not to have mentioned Chogum because obviously the uh, Commonwealth heads of government meeting uh, postponed by a year um, is a real opportunity. You know, Rwanda, I think, has achieved many great things in terms of its uh, development, um, including some really interesting work in uh, education. 
I think Chogham, obviously there's going to be a lot of different things that Chogham is going to be addressing. Um, health will rightly, I'm sure, be a, a high uh, priority, but I do hope, going back to the two themes of my lecture, that the set of issues around the rule of law and good governance and the set of issues around uh, Global Goal 4 and education feature highly um, at Chogham. Uh, and I look forward to working with uh, other organisations on, on the call and with Comsec and governments, including the UK as the chair in office and Rwanda as the host of Chogham to try to ensure that both education and good governance and peace and justice are high up the, um, the agenda. And you know, Rwanda, I did some work uh, previously with the Aegis Trust, which established the Kigali uh, Genocide Memorial. So if we're thinking about Global Goal 16 and peace and justice, you know, what happened in Rwanda in 1994 is one of the starkest uh, reminders to us all of what happens when uh, there isn't peace and there isn't justice in a society. And education about those sorts of things is an important part of education, as well as the other, as well as reading, writing, and science, and all of the other things. Um, on the question on um, equitable access and how uh, to influence that, I think there is there's there's a range of ways this can be done. So I think you know speaking with my my work hat on parliamentarians have a responsibility and an opportunity to press on issues of equity. Um, I also think that uh, multilateral organizations do too. One of the things I've always respected about the Global Partnership for Education is that they provide support to um, governments and education systems in low-income countries, but they also expect increased spending by uh, those countries in terms of domestic resource mobilization. And I think multilaterals can play a positive and proactive and progressive uh, role in that regard, including challenging with respect to uh, questions of uh, equity of access, be that for you know, children with disabilities, be that for girls, uh, be that for minorities, be it ethnic or religious uh, minorities who can often face uh, discrimination or uh, unequal access to education systems. So parliamentarians, both globally and at the local level can, multilaterals um, can. And then of course, and this brings me to Anya's question is, civil society and uh, clearly and is another example of why you know global goal 16 is so important for the other goals is that if you've got a vibrant healthy uh, domestic civil society then it can be speaking up if there isn't uh, equitable um, access uh, to education or if there is discrimination against different groups i take um the implication in um, in anya's question about you know how do we turn the words into into actions and I was conscious of that um, preparing what I was saying particularly some of the enormous numbers that I quoted uh, with regard to the need uh, in education it can seem very very daunting and I think although we do need those big numbers and that global conversation is important and probably is where I focused more today actually a lot of it's also about country by country making the case uh, and bringing all the partners and stakeholders together to make the case about what needs to be done in that country, because of course, the circumstances of one country differ enormously from another. Can I, uh, there's several more questions, Sunny. I'm very aware that you're, we, we're going short on time, but um, can I bring you back to a CPA related one, Steve? And this is from Peter, Peter Williams. Peter asks, where does CPA draw the balance between capacity building for Commonwealth parliaments stroke parliamentarians and mobilising cooperative action by the Commonwealth on development or democracy issues? Does it ever have sessions on sectoral issues like education or health? Great. Um, Peter, uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. I, I think the way I'd answer that is to say the, the kind of core business, if you like, or the core mission um, of uh, CPA for a long time is about capacity building. So we have our benchmarks for democratic legislatures, which are a key tool, and we work with uh, our branches, with parliaments across the Commonwealth 
uh, to look to implement those uh, benchmarks so that they can be more effective as parliamentarians. So capacity building without doubt is at the heart of what the CPA does. But I think we have an opportunity to continue to do that and to do even more of that and do it better, even better, but also to do the second of the things that you've rightly outlined, mobilizing action, joining in alliances with others. Um, we've had, so in, in, in my short time in the CPA this year, uh, we've had a number of um, webinars on topics. So for example, as uh, people may know, we have a network for our smaller branches uh, and they've had a big focus this year on climate change, the environment and biodiversity with a number of online seminars addressing those sorts of issues. Actually, a lot of the push within the CPA for more work on the SDGs has come for perfectly understandable reasons from some of our small branches, many of which are small island uh, developing states. We have our uh, conference that is uh, usually an annual conference, obviously we've, we've not had it this year, the Commonwealth Parliamentarians Conference, and that certainly is an opportunity where thematic issues like educational health can be addressed and we're planning the next conference for Canada uh, next year. But I think there is scope for us to do more in this sphere, certainly in the set of issues that relate most directly to the core mission. So those that are about the rule of law and good governance and uh, SDG 16. But I think also probably, you know, more modestly, because there's we, we're not an enormous organisation, but also in some of the um, uh, specific spheres like education, like health, like climate change. The other thing, of course, to say is I speak wearing the hat of the, the Secretariat of the CPA internationally. We have 180 branches and many of our branches are very active on these themes. Uh, so, for example, CPA UK has been doing some amazing work on uh, modern slavery, human trafficking, that area. Um, a lot of our branches in the Pacific and Australia do a lot of work around women's empowerment, addressing climate change. So at a national or even a sub-national level, often these thematic issues are addressed, but I do think we have scope to do more of the mobilizing action alongside the capacity building. And Moving slightly away onto a slightly different one um, and, and relating three, loosely relating three questions. Um, the first uh, from Nicholas Watts, who, who asked some of the ABC countries in the Commonwealth, may, the main funders of, of much of the Commonwealth activities, face challenges of populism. Do their governments need to ensure college level education to all in their own countries to ensure lasting commitment to the SDGs in the multilateral system, rather than withdrawing and pointing out as the US has done uh, from some of the commitment to the SDGs. Uh, so um, that's one. Another one around that comes from uh, Kumba Conte, who asks on a more general sphere, but we could see it from the ABCs as well as uh, within the, um, uh, the, the wider mix. With the democratic process of electing government every four to five years, each incoming government with their own agendas, is there a way the Commonwealth could provide a sort of directives in line with key SDGs so countries can make it into law so that a change of government would not mean a change in efforts to achieving these goals. And then a, a, a small aspect of it from the UK side is the closure of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies or the proposed closure, let's call it that. I've seen some of the correspondence. What are your thoughts on this? Is there any way this important institution can continue to uh, provide uh, research and support for people in the Commonwealth? And that comes from Priscilla Moyunda. Thank you very much. Let, let, let me really held together questions. No, thanks, Neil. And let, let me start with that because I think there is um, there is widespread um, concern across the Commonwealth family. Um, including amongst parliamentarians about the, uh, the position with regard to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. 
uh, we at the CPA coordinated a letter that was signed by uh, a significant cohort of um, organizations and individuals uh, from, com from the Commonwealth to the university. And five of us met last week with uh, the vice chancellor to express uh, those concerns. Uh, you know, I think it is incredibly important that um, the Commonwealth is featuring in, well, I mean, to broaden it actually, and it kind of broadens in a way to partly address Nicholas's question, more broadly in education, um, that um, not just to have good quality university provision around Commonwealth studies, which is clearly important, but actually for children and young people to learn uh, about the Commonwealth as part of uh, global uh, citizenship. So uh, clearly um, there is a lot of support for um, continuing the Institute. That message has got across uh, to uh, the university. Um, I, uh, including from a number of parliamentarians who've engaged with this on a cross party basis. I don't think it's entirely clear what is going to happen, but I think the voices of the Commonwealth have been absolutely loud and clear on it and the university has, uh, has heard them. Um, in terms of how you entrench these things, I mean, it's a great question, Kumba's question, um, and it's always one of the challenges of democratic politics is that um, governments come, governments go. In fact, not just governments, ministers come and ministers uh, go, and how do you entrench? I mean, it's something, actually, when I was shadow education secretary, I tried to look at how you could have a more long-term approach to the development of, of education policy. I think my answer is, Sometimes, sometimes passing a law does do what you suggest, actually. So, you know, an interesting example of that in the UK is the 0.7% commitment on uh, official development assistance, which was put into law. And I think it being in law, although obviously any law can be repealed uh, in the British system, I think it has provided some protection uh, for that commitment. So I think sometimes legislating is the answer, but I think the, the better answer is building a consensus. <laughs> Um, uh, across uh, parties and politicians so that a change of minister or a change of government doesn't automatically result in everything being looked at again. And, you know, that's kind of then takes me to Nicholas's uh, very good question around the impact of uh, rising uh, populism, because I think there are, I, I think I'd answer it in two ways. I, one of the things that politicians, and I you know, say this as a former politician, I suppose, uh, haven't always been very good at is understanding some of the reasons that have led to that populism and the decline in trust in um, public institutions, including uh, in politics, and perhaps to have a, a degree of humility about that and to engage with those that feel very disconnected uh, from politics and therefore will sometimes turn to support populist causes. But in terms of the impact that then has internationally, you know, absolutely reaffirming commitments to multilateralism and you know, very, very, you know, I think I can say that I have to be careful. I, mean, I keep forgetting I'm not a politician anymore, so I'm not, not meant to comment on all these things, but I think it's relatively uncontroversial to say that a US that returns to the uh, Paris uh, Accords and rejoins the World Health Organization will be a, will be a, a good thing uh, for um, the Commonwealth and for the cause uh, of multilateralism. And finally, Nicholas's actual question around education, you know, I do think whether it's, whether it's staying in college, I think it's more about, I think it's more about kind of the quality of education um, and the breadth of education in the compulsory uh, period. And I think it's about public discourse and how we can have a, a kind of public discourse that is, dare I say, just more civilized and respectful of differences of opinion. And I think if we could foster that in all parts, because I don't think this is exclusively a problem of one end or the other of the political spectrum. I think there've been issues about this in all parts of the political spectrum, uh, a debate on politics and policy that is more mutually respectful and civilized. I think that could contribute as well uh, to a, a sustainable development um, approach in the future. Well, I, thank you, thank you, and uh, um, I'm very aware of the time, and uh, there's a couple of other things to do, and I think we've had a very good um, uh, coverage of, of the of the wide ranging issues that that around education, education development, the Commonwealth SDGs in particular, well, and then SDGs more widely. There are a couple of other questions around. Um, 
the SDGs and in particular the education one and the growing marketization and the privatization uh, of higher education, uh, of education at all levels, but uh, higher education. But I think that's that's quite a big issue to adopt here now. I mean, I, I, I so I think I better hand back to Sonny and say that we can enter dialogue with anyone else who has more questions to put in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Neil, for moderating the session. Stephen, thank you so much for answering these wide ranging questions. And I, I know there are plenty, plenty more uh, brilliant questions and also I'm sure people want to contribute. But because of the time, we really got to sort of bring this to a close. So before I do that, I want to just thank Neil and Stephen for really sort of uh, answering those questions. Uh, may I invite now uh, one of our trustees, Alistair uh, Niven, to uh, say a word of thanks, please, Alistair. Well, thank you. Um, can I first thank the Council for Education in the Commonwealth for bringing about this remarkable event tonight, um, and particularly Sunny, you, for inviting Stephen. I know your friends. And uh, for leading the CEC so inspiringly. Thanks very much. And thanks, Neil, for managing. It's a very difficult task managing Q&A. And uh, of course, it's only possible if you get really excellent questions. And tonight, you certainly got that. And they were very, very brilliantly answered. But thank you, Neil, for your role in that. Um, I imagine that all of us who are here tonight would like to be in the same room uh, physically as Stephen. But what, of course, his friendly manner has allowed is to make us feel that we actually were alongside him during the course of this evening. And that, that's really a, a tremendous achievement. Thanks very much. And of course, there are advantages to being virtual. We've been joined tonight by people in different parts of the Commonwealth and around the world who couldn't possibly assemble in London, even if we dangled the possibility of the talk being in the mother of all parliaments at Westminster, uh, where, of course, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association is itself based. Um, so it's a particular welcome to those who have joined us from around the globe. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without COVID. So thank you, COVID. Um, Stephen's new job, of course, is to reach out to all the countries of the Commonwealth and to link our commonalities. We feel really privileged, Stephen. I wish I could kind of look you in the eye, but it's quite difficult to do that on screen. But um, thank you for choosing to share your reflections tonight with us within a few weeks of taking up your important role. We really are very lucky in that respect to have heard you so early in your tenure and uh, so stimulating. You've spoken tonight with great relevance to the Council for Education in the Commonwealth. Um, understanding that our core purpose, of course, is, is education. Um, and it's to promote education at all levels. Um, good educational practice, of course, is not possible without good governance, whether that is at the political level or even in the school level or the university level, uh, it's essential. Um, good governance and good citizenship. Um, I was particularly pleased to hear you emphasize the importance of girls' education. That's a cause dear to the heart of the CEC. And uh, not so many months ago, we held a session on menstrual hygiene and how the absence of that in so many parts of the world actually seriously disrupts young girls' education. Um, we also were pleased to hear you speaking, of course, about the need for peace and justice, because without those, I mean, it, it's all blown to sky high. Um, the sustainable development goals that you've talked about tonight are exactly that, they're goals, and um, they can only be scored uh, if our aim is sound and our teamwork is in place and our determination to win is all consuming. Speaking for myself, and I hope all of us tonight, uh, you've made me feel that this is a match where we can all emerge as the champions if we have people like you leading the team, and if we take to heart the emphasis you've placed on collaboration and innovation. Thank you for that. Um, so thank you from every one of us present tonight, Stephen. Um, it's been a really 
good Gladwin lecture. Um, the lecture, of course, is named after a great British diplomat and internationalist, and I feel we have another amongst us now in you. Uh, thank you for your vision, your insights, your compassion, your practicality, uh, and of course your clarity. Uh, you emphasize the importance of investment. Um, if there were shares in Stephen Twigg, I would certainly be investing in them. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Um, we've enjoyed your lecture tonight. And I'd like to say, as we are the Council for Education in the Commonwealth, that we've all been truly educated by it too. Thank you very much, Stephen, and you're welcome back anytime to the CEC. Many thanks. Alistair, thank you. If I might thank Alistair for that very generous uh, vote of thanks, but also obviously to, to thank Neil and Sonny for hosting us all and all of the participants. And there were some fantastic questions. I, uh, I, hope, I, um, I hope I gave reasonable answers to them, but really enjoyed the conversation this evening. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, Alistair. Before I bring this uh, meeting to a close, may I also thank each and every one of you who have taken the time out this evening to join us uh, for this uh, really stimulating lecture itself. Look, uh, for those who wish to be members of uh, the Council for Education Commonwealth, our website has got a, a membership form. Please come and join us. We're a really nice bunch. Uh, we, we're quite active. We do have a number of events planned, especially next year uh, in the run-up to Chogum and also the uh, Global Partnership uh, for Education meeting sometime in the middle of 2021. We're planning to have a, a number of events running up to that, plus our Commonwealth Day lecture, uh, which is in November. So check out our website. Uh, the details will be there uh, in due course. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening and stay safe and healthy. Thank you. <laughs>